and more subtly uh, I said to me, talk about preaching. Uh, homiletics is what we Lutherans like to call that. And I think the first time I ever found myself in a kind of a jovial disagreement with Adam Kuntz is when I said something like, I don't believe homiletics exists. And, uh, and he said something like, that's crazy talk. You know, that can't be, uh, you know, we need homiletics. Well, I think he and I generally agree on almost everything except perhaps terminology at times. And in an age of Babel, terminology is what the fight's about. So if we're going to talk about preaching, proclamation, testimony, prophecy, witness, the word of God, the Bible, truth, it's all the same thing. And the guy who is a pastor is supposed to be good at it and make it so you know it. But he's not supposed to be the only one who can do it. Although no one's supposed to get up in the pulpit and pretend they're him, right? Right. But but Christians are all Christians. And we're Christians because we're inhabited and inspired by the everlasting living word of God. The same Holy Spirit who was in a burning bush now is poured out in New Testament power upon all his people with prophetic tendencies, which doesn't mean you can tell the future. That's Gnosticism, and I may talk about that. But prophetic tendencies means you just like to tell the truth. And it really bothers you when the truth isn't told. And sometimes you'll come out and say it and you get in trouble for it. That's the prophetic mind. You believe there are things that never change. So to begin talking about homiletics, uh, I'm just going to shout what must be understood is that the New Testament spirit is the <laughs> prophetic mind of Christ alive among us. And the homiletician is just the guy who's supposed to say it. So we all go, I heard it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> right? Now, why would it be that when I do this currently, people say to me, you're doing something different? I think that's why I'm here. Maybe it's because of worldview everlasting, you know, you know, bring up speaker, get a crowd. That's smart, guys. It's smart. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm kind of small hockey sticks too these days, but I'm close. So I'm glad to drive up today and be here. Uh, I, but I, I, there's so many things I would love to talk about. If you listen to Brief History of Power, you know about the battle against the whole friggin' everything that's going on right now. And so we could talk about why it matters to be able to speak prophetically to this government from the pulpit. I mean, I could spend an hour just on that. But I don't, I don't think that helps us here because I also know this conference is pretty unique. None of us have, say, Donald Trump's ear. Or do you? Because if you do, I want to talk to you about what you should say. Yeah. But what I'm going to say is you should say the same things that you should say no matter whose ear you have. And that the pastor is the guy who's supposed to be up in front of you saying it so you can imitate him. So I would say that the first key to all biblical preaching is that it's supposed to say, follow me. Not just follow Jesus. But as Paul says, follow me as I follow Jesus. According to his word, and I stand in front with you all having the word, so you can follow along, and you can say, you're lying, or you can say, that's not what you said, and then you can pelt me with sh poop. <laughs> Luther said it the other way. Uh, Luther said it the other way. You can pelt me with poo and drive me out so I don't talk anymore because I'm confusing the children. It should be that clear all the time. But we live in an age where the babel is so complete that now I can say something that makes total sense. And you go, yes, that makes sense. And we have completely different ideas. Really. But as long as we've got the right brand and the right keywords, we'll keep running in the same direction right off a cliff. <laughs> really, right? And 2020, I mean, do, do we have to dig into what 2020 means? So what I really want to do today is more just inspire you with how simple the word is. If you open to Leviticus 27, well, actually, that one's pretty good, I think. But it, it, you open some random chapter, 
and you don't know what you're doing, there's a good chance you find out that the Bible's confusing. It scares you, and everyone says, read it, it'll make your life better, and you're like, that was hard, I don't understand. The pastor is supposed to be the guy that that can't happen to. All right, so if you really want to distinguish us, we're just held accountable for not being able to be tricked. Like, you never heard of that before. Now, that's quite a task. No one's prepared for this above reproach, 1 Timothy 3. After, you know, we go into all that too. But the fact is, again, that it is, it is a simple faith that we have. And if instead of trying to treat the Bible as if it is only one or two words, and while philosophically, yes, law, gospel, absolutely. And yeah, it's only in English if you're reading it in English. So it's only one word in that sense. You can get into that. But in fact, it's there's 66 books, different books. They're all different. And they're written across like aeons. You know, so you think Shakespeare's ch- tough. Try some Chaucer, right? And again, we put it in New English all the time and keep changing it and updating it to make it more clear. And I'm going to tell you, I'm, I read the Greek and Hebrew mediocrely, and it's not getting more clear. It's getting less clear. We're making it more confusing. And every time we go in and we adjust this little thing, we play with these words. The craziest part to me is that we've never questioned the initial English translation. We are following so many habits of translation that are just the rules and the way we have to do it. And I think we miss sacraments. I think we miss the spirit of God. I think there's all sorts of stuff going on that just didn't get into English because the reformed made the first translation. What does that mean? How do we get back in? Where do we find the spirit? I don't think we need our own translation just to have it happen. But it does mean finding the parts of the Bible that are so clear and so simple that I can give it to some schmuck who can barely read on the street. I can sing it in his ears once in the morning, once at noon, and once at night, and it'll change his life. That's what you're just talking about, Daniel, right? Like the Lutheran church changed everyone's lives because when you were at at work that week, you were humming the tunes. And if there's something to learn about the worship wars, is that the Reformation belongs to the Pentecostals right now. They're pushing the Bible. They're pushing Jesus. They're changing the Roman Catholic Church. And we're arguing about how we do it in our corners with each other. While our preaching gets worse and worse and worse, in my opinion. Now, again, I guess that's a bit arrogant, yeah? Yeah. I've been here 17 years a pastor. I preached a lot. I don't preach the same way I used to. You go back to find my old sermons, they're not bad. They're like good law gospel stuff. Like I really figured out that whole camera, control it, manage it, deliver it. Like I, I had it. I think I was good at it. I was entertaining. I never saw disciples really get going though. And by that I mean, I got people to be like, oh, iceberg confession. Yeah. And I... I love the Augsburg Confession. I think it's a platform for unity between churches. That's where we begin unifying churches is the Augsburg Confession. But again, my, my, my friend Bob, who works in the steel mill and can barely read, what he needs is Psalm 47 and 8. So let's, let's start here. Bible. Psalm 40. What happens, I believe, if you stop trying to explain to everybody all the ways they could get the Bible wrong... And so they better be careful and get it right, like Lutherans. If you stop that, what happens is once they get into the Bible, they just start getting inspired by it, and they start doing stuff it says, and they start believing it's it's about them. And may I say, right about then, some Lutheran comes along and they say, I've said it, it's true also, it's not about you. It's about Jesus for you. Yeah, Christ for you, Jesus for you. It's true, except for the phrase, Jesus for you. Guess what? That's kind of like all about you. Like there you are dying, about to be sent into hell, and in comes Jesus and saves you. You. Today. Not just when you were baptized, not just when you made your decision for Jesus or figured out you had to follow him and decided I follow Jesus now, uh, but uh, not just the future, not just judgment day. Today. Where has Lutheranism lost its soul? We have theories about ideas that don't serve our people in salvation today. Or we believe in a God who's far away, 
And we say theology of the cross to keep him safe. It's okay, we just suffer. It's just what we are. It's theology of the cross. Or you can repent sometimes. I mean, to be sure, Job, his lesson is, I don't know. And God's lesson is, well, actually, I was fixing it for you. So again, even there, right? It's always good that you've heard me say it yet, optimism, election. The doctrine of election is the doctrine of it's going to be better. It means optimism is the Christian position. And if you find yourself hearing news and speaking words that are sarcastic or sardonic or cynical, guess what? You just abandoned your hope because you trusted in the world and its story. The Bible gives you a different story. Let's start opening that story in a way that I think can serve you today. If you're a pastor, it can serve you today. If you're a father, a mother, a child. And what it means is start believing the Bible is about you because it's about Jesus. He fulfills it. And now from history through the church, he has chosen you by shoving water on your face so you can't deny it and told you it's about you now. And my spirit is within you. So come on, wake up and watch. Let's get busy. You don't have to justify anything. You just go to fight, knowing God is with you. So here, uh, Psalm 48. Did I say that right? I'm sorry. Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. And your law, Torah, is within my heart. I heard a guy in the last year on the radio tell a story that I could almost believe. (laughs) I have to believe it because he said it. It reminds me of another story. I'll tell you the other story first. I heard a guy on the radio. I was like in in college. I kind of came back into the church through the candle radio in Northern California. Seventh-day Adventists. God be praised for grace. The gospel was there. It helped. Um, they're good over there. Uh, so on the candle, I remember one time listening to some show. I don't remember what it was, but these guys are talking. And I, I think indeed the guy was trying to say stuff like, you know, uh, Jesus is really the archangel Michael, which if you get into seventh day Adventist cult side of stuff, that is, that is where they go. Like they're Aryans. Um, but he was saying that. And the other guy started and he said, well, it all started when I found a Bible in a cave and I turned the radio off. <laughs> right. I'm done. But I heard a story more recently about a guy who doesn't know a lot. He's even he's like, he's, he's influencing people. He's speaking about the Bible. He's reading the Bible, but he acknowledges he's just a learner. But it all started when he opened the Bible randomly and found verses 7 and 8 of Psalm 40, what he found when he was dark and alone and had nothing left and nowhere to go. And the, the book told him the book was about him and he should read it. Now, take a step back and imagine what it was like when you were like the seven-year-old Jesus and you found these verses the first time. Test your incarnation theology there a little bit. What does the humiliation of Jesus look like? I think he found this and he was like, oh, yep. (laughs) And I think we should too. Because we're in him now. We are his body. He promises. There's, there's no greater doctrine of the church than that we're his body. And so indeed, you can read this anytime you wish. Memorize it. Say it to yourself. Believe it that it is true. It is written of you in this book. It is written of you in Jesus in this book. And everything about this book and its stories and its people who are all also in Jesus. Huh? Except the ones that are cast away, of course. But you know the, the, the heroes of the faith... It is there to inspire you to live today in Jesus. And it will do so, generally speaking, unless some teacher comes in the way and tells you not to trust it. Because of all the reasons they can come up with why it might be wrong. And I I guarantee you that's exactly how the devil does it every time. Did God really say? Does God really say it's about you? Isn't it about Jesus instead? Like, do you see how you can use that to actually destroy faith without knowing? That's why law gospel isn't as easy as bullet points. But you got to know who you're talking to a little bit. You say one thing and kill them, say the same thing to someone else, they come alive. It's not magic. It's not ritual performance alone. I love the space talk you brought up. So, okay, so that's 47 to 8. 
Start there with the belief that this Bible is about you and your life today, and it will inspire you to call upon God in every trouble that you find, to pray, pray, and give thanks for every victory, and to expect the victory through the cross, which means I might have to suffer, but I'll know that I'm confident in Christ, and I'll probably see some good come of it. Might not be mine, but that's actually even more glorious. Oh, that's the thing right there, glory. I want to talk about glory. Let's, let's see if it comes up in the text. So, so from there, uh, look at Psalm 1. Okay, so Psalm 1 is, is a place to just realize you don't know how to pray, probably. It's a great question. The Psalms is the prayer book of the Bible. Psalm 1 is therefore the first prayer in the Bible. And it doesn't ask for much. Not, not really any petitions in Psalm 1. And you can just see how, how anemic our theology of prayer is. We think of prayer as petitions. And we lose, correct me if I'm wrong, I just kind of put these together this week, so there may be more to this dogma. But I think prayer um, can be put in in three concepts, uh, petition being one of them, prophecy being another one, uh, and then um, uh, blessing being the third one. And if I would distinguish those, um, uh, all of these things are speaking words in the sight of God. That's what prayer really is then. I am speaking with knowledge that he's listening. And if I speak to him, this is how petition goes, right? But if I speak to you, the Lord bless you and keep you. Okay, well, this is his words, my words. We're all, this is prayer, actually, forward with positivity, blessing. I'm sorry, oh. And then um, the same thing as your prophecy. It's just got the more negative edge to it. It's like, you stop it or you will go to hell. Right? That, that's prophetic prayer. Witness, testimony, confession, word of God in our lives, making us who we are. Tearing that apart. Rather than seeing it all as the enlivening of our tongues by the Holy Spirit, um, that's what's gotten at us, I think, in a lot of ways. We have divided tongues. I'm trying to make that case somewhat from the text. Psalm 1, then again, shows us how anemic our, our understanding of the word prayer really is. And then it also comes out of the gates, not as a petition, or so much as a prophecy, although it has prophetic tendencies. But really, what is Psalm 1? It is a blessing. It says so right at the beginning, blessed is the man. And what are you supposed to do? Feel like you're not him? So Lutherans would do. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Well, I know I can't do that. I have to walk in the counsel of the wicked. I'm a sinner. Right? And then we go along and we let them tell us what to do and we end up supporting all manner of wickedness without knowing it. Silliness here. So blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked is a a prayer to you and us as one stating what will be good from God in our lives according to his promises. We can be certain of that, that these blessings do come to pass like we like to think of prophecy as telling the future. So you are blessed in Jesus Christ. You will sprout green leaves the rest of eternity. You will never perish. It's true. It's prayer and it's identity built into the prayer at the start of, again, the prayer book of the Bible the Psalms. So the, you're already here to study the Psalms. You're talking about the Psalms. So I'm not going to belabor the need for the Psalter. We'll maybe come back to it with Sons of Solomon at the end. Um, but I want to go to some other texts from here then uh, that really are part of what, what woke me up in the last three years. So Ecclesiastes. When I talk about there being, uh, turn to Ecclesiastes 12. When I talk about there being uh, you know, 66 different books in the Bible, and then we go to the NIV or the New King James or, or any, any translation, because they're all based upon kind of the initial uh, English work done by, uh, uh, I'm going to lose the guy's name with the W. Mm, Tyndale, thank you. Um, there's, a, there's another one with the W too, isn't there? Wycliffe. Wycliffe. Reformed guys, they did well, they meant well, but like really any school or group that goes to Genesis to Zechariah and in three years translates all of it is guaranteed to miss most of it in terms of flavor. Because the Hebrew of Isaiah is not the Hebrew of Moses. You got like 800, 1200 years goes on. The language changes so much. We all have it kind of like it's written the same. That's because some monks in 800 AD kind of cataloged it a little bit. And we got some real old Greek we can mesh it with. But what you find it again is that even through all of that, Moses doesn't talk like Isaiah. Although Isaiah does use Moses' words. And this is my biggest premise. It's what Ecclesiastes 12, I think, will show us. 
is that nobody ever comes along and says anything new. They come along and they see the big picture and they see how so much of it's been stolen and they grab these pieces that are still true and they throw them in the ground and they say, this is our religion. And then out of it comes life again. And you go back into Moses with the goads, the nails of Isaiah, the words of Isaiah. You go back to Moses, you find Christ then in Moses too. Whereas if you just come at it as Moses, you may never run into Christ, especially if you just end with Joseph. Right? Although, you know, Christ is there to be seen, right? But only as the revelation informs back. So with that said, Ecclesiastes 12, 9 to 14 uh, came about as a bit of a fantasy guess for me in my mind what this is going to do. But let me see if I can't bring you along on this game, because if it's not true, it doesn't matter. This is the thing. This is a story. This is, this is, a, this is a, uh, a little bit of a, a surmising based on the text. The text is going to be here. Um, but the thing is, like, what I'm going to do with it as a game, gamifying it, like if the game is kind of like not 100% right exactly, like tit for tat, doesn't matter. And I'll try to explain that here also. Okay, so he says, at the end of the book, right, vanity of vanities and all this, uh, moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of the scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by these. Of making many books there is no end, Much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Uh, Focus in on verse 10. The preacher sought to find acceptable words. Yes, what was written was upright words of truth. Verse 11, goads and well-driven nails. So, there's a couple things I just assume. One is that Solomon is actually the smartest guy that ever lived. After Jesus. Like, this isn't just kind of an idea, a story. No, in fact, he saw further, he understood more, and no one shall ever have the mind of this guy. So if I go and I read Ecclesiastes or Proverbs, I don't know, like it's Chronicles, although I think Daniel wrote Chronicles, and I think he's a genius too. But but if I read it like it's just kind of a history thing, right, and just treat it like it's that, Chronicles, and don't realize, oh, this is the wisest guy who ever lived, and it's the only stuff he made sure survived, and God made sure it survived too, in the name of Jesus, to teach me how to walk today. I assume that about Solomon, okay? Even though he fell away in his old age, did he repent, come back, you can, you know, you can chase that story, but to me, I don't care if he fell away in his old age. God put the, the words in the book, did he not? So whatever Solomon did, it wasn't because of what the book says. And God made him who he was so the book could say what it says for us. And so when he says he spent his whole life looking for the right words, and then he wrote them down so you can rely on them like nails when you build your barn. And it says in the verse before, he did this in Proverbs. I thought... Are you telling me Proverbs is a dictionary of Middle Ancient Hebrew? Now, that's been three years of my game, and I still think I'm right. Although, if I'm wrong, it doesn't matter, because all that happens is, if you do this, you just study a lot of Hebrew. <laughs> you, know, you study a lot of the Word of God, you'll go right eventually. But I haven't been shown wrong yet in terms of how what happens in Proverbs is individual terminology from Moses before Isaiah is taken and bound together to hold faith in Jesus Christ by name. Trust in Jesus Christ with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Jesus is Lord. Faith in Jesus Christ by name is the prominent message of Proverbs. And it says Torah teaches this. And you come along to Isaiah, and what does Isaiah say? You lost everything Proverbs says you should have. Righteousness, judgment, equity. The things that, that Isaiah excoriates us for is the loss of this language these words. Now, take that idea that there are words in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that function as technical terminology to go back and see Jesus through the Spirit in the text that came before. 
uh, take that idea and that these, this dictionary is then therefore inspired and without error on a certain level and put yourself in the babble that we're in right now where I say X and you think it means Y and we don't know how to talk to each other and everyone's about to shoot each other with bombs in the sky. Maybe if I have words that I can take that are English words, but I can tie them in my own heart to what the Bible's worldview calls those words, maybe I'll start thinking like they did. I don't even think that's a big deal. That's just how language works, okay? That's just psychology. I mean, it's not that hard. Is it, you know, uh, what do you call it? Cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and yet, this is how the church has always operated. The text just wakes us up. And again, so I'm suggesting that Proverbs gives you good goads. So let's look at Proverbs 1, 2 to 7 to try to make that case very briefly. I've done more on this. Um, if you go to revfisk.com, uh, the, the sticky post at the top has my uh, three different talks I've given this year. Um, and in, in one of those talks, I go into a lot more detail on this part of Scripture, uh, Proverbs 1, 2 to 7, and how I believe these initial verses are uh, the, the, the codex or the key to the Proverbs Dictionary. Um, all I want to do is just, is just pull out how powerful each of these words is if you let it never change its meaning. Don't let them come along and tell you it means something else. It means what the Bible says it is. And when the Bible uses it in stories, it means it. And when it comes into the New Testament, it's translated. It also is important. So particularly, uh, verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction. In knowledge, everybody seems to understand wisdom. We all know there ain't enough of it. What's instruction compared to those things? And would you, by the way, in your daily reading, ever stop at verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction, and ask yourself, why doesn't he just say to know wisdom? What's the difference between wisdom and instruction? And in English, you just waste your time. Don't even try. Because... It's English. What's the difference between Chachma and Musar? Uh, and they're neither Yada. So now you have three words right off the bat that are different things that we all can confuse. Knowledge, wisdom, and this other thing that goes with it. I'll, discipline would be the word I would use. Discipline. Why? Go into all nations. Make disciples. I actually think that's what it's saying. To know wisdom and discipleship. And to be a Christian. That's really what it says right away. But each of those words is important. Wisdom is how you see. Knowledge is how you remember. Discipline is what you do next. It's the human life in three words. Uh, to perceive words of understanding, that word understanding and perceive in New King James are both the same Hebrew word, being. It means to be between. Oh, I thought I had a board for a second. So like, this is a dot. And this is a dot, right? A and B. A is an apple. B is an orange. Bean, understanding, is between. So their word for between is their word for understanding as well. It's really cool. Hebrew is amazing. So that's right there. And bean will be all over the place. In fact, it's the root of the t word taboo, which means things we don't know because we understand they ruin everything when we do them. We don't even have to have you prove it. We just know. We know from old times, no one does that. We all die if we do that. That's taboo. We have understanding, right? But what does taboo mean now? <laughs> oh, different things. Uh, to receive, there it is, the discipline of wisdom, although there's a different word working on there. But justice, judgment, and equity, those three words. Um, uh, Zedek, um, it's been a little while since I did this. Uh, it's uh, Zedek, Mishpat, and uh, Meshurim. So Zedek is the word righteousness, justification, uh, uh, accuracy, hitting the target, right? Sin is to miss the target. Justification is to hit the target. Um, that's that word right there, which is part of discipline, right? And then judgment, Mishpat. Um, this doesn't mean so much righteousness as um, uh, getting the measure right, right? Um, uh, is balancing on the scales is good, although that's also symmetrical and measurement isn't only symmetry because symmetry is this next word, equity there, meshirim, which I'm going fast, but like, like meshirim is super cool because this is a word that's actually the word yashar, which means straight or upright in the dual, meaning two. So it's plural, but only two. <laughs> and, and so it's dual uprights. 
or you might think of it as parallel lines, which believe it or not, there's geometry in this too. He, he just said so with the word being parallel uprights, meaning symmetrical. It's, it's incredible as a language, what this does. Now, I'm not suggesting every lay person needs to find this, although I think you'll just, you'll just eat it up. But I will suggest the Proverbs are that good, that Solomon knew that much that he understood that far ahead, that he really was a believer and he wrote as God inspired him to do for us today. Um, from there, um, I think the next place I would take you is Proverbs 22, 17 to 21. Okay, these are places where like, not only is it worth it for you to find these again and again, but if you've got that friend who just doesn't get it, Right. Um, instead of like trying to make them read these verses or something like that, like memorize these verses and then begin to speak them to your friend as if they're true about their friend, your friend. And your friend doesn't really get to have a choice about it being true. They cannot believe it, but they can't stop it. But it's, oh, no, no, it says right there in the Bible, it's written about you. No, it's written about you. You should read it. It says so. I think. I think a lot of pagans won't know what to do with that kind of energy, honestly. They won't quite understand it. They'll, they'll, they'll think, but don't you have to tell me something? Don't I have to give my heart to Jesus? Look, you're going to give your heart to Jesus. <laughs> Just read the book. You know? like, like, instead of trying to seal the deal like Americans, right? Spit the seeds. And, and Proverbs 22, 17 to, to 22, 21 is a great seed. Incline your ear. And hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge for it is a pleasant thing if you keep them within you. Let them all be fixed upon your lips so that your trust may be in Jesus Christ. I have instructed you, disciplined you today, even you. Have I not written to you excellent things of counsels and knowledge that I may make you know the certainty of the words of truth that you may answer words of truth to those who send you. That's not quite the conclusion of Solomon's portion of the book of Proverbs. Solomon will continue writing uh, up through, I think, the end of chapter 24. Uh, you also have a section for the sayings of the wise and whatnot. But it is kind of out of left field uh, as you're reading the book. Because from chapter 10 until this point, you mostly have individual Proverbs or parallels, sometimes a triplet, um, but usually just individual Proverbs. And then you get this like big poem here. Which says a lot, but I just want to focus in on um, verse 20, no, no, verse 19. So your trust may be in Jesus. There it is. Justification by grace through faith in the Proverbs. Don't ever doubt it. <laughs> uh, uh, I have disciplined, I have musard you today, even you. So like, Solomon's sitting somewhere, you know, when he's writing, when, when he's writing, does he do it all in one draft? Mm -hmm. Or did he figure out, was, was paper so cheap because of uh, where they were in the world, uh, because he has money flowing out everywhere, that he could just draft on paper? Or is he like the Easterners, where he's got like a thing of sand and a stick, and he's trying to figure out how to say it best over and over again, and wiping it out until he can finally write it down. But as he's figuring this out, he's imagining that for eternity, until Jesus returns, people are going to read these words. And he's got all these Proverbs in a, in a row. And he's like, look, I've given you all the wisdom, but my biggest concern is my son, Rehoboam, who I know doesn't listen to a thing I say. And so I'm deeply concerned he won't hear me. I know everyone else has the same stupid hard head. So he writes, not only I have instructed you, he kind of goes fourth wall breaking. I'm talking to you today. You don't get to ignore that in my world, in this book. That, that means not just to Jesus. Although Jesus definitely read these words, believed them, put them into practice, and everyone said, where did he get this knowledge? But that knowledge is now given to you. Now look at the end of it. So that you may answer words of truth to him who sends you. Now that can be two different directions, but really any scenario, any moment in life, you know the people who you're afraid of. You know the times and places you're scared of coming to pass. I have written to you so that no matter what comes to pass, I'll go Psalm 118 on this one, you may walk at liberty and open your mouth in integrity and not have to plan what you're going to say because all you're going to say is what God has said because you say it so often, it's all you really know anymore. 
And yeah, you're still a sinner. You're not perfect. You're not more righteous. Blah, blah, blah. Stop it, Americans. That's the, that Reformation argument about how we're saved that we get into in our own heads. Rather than the confidence that under grace, we can't fail. Because we're chosen now. We're chosen now. Once saved, always says no. Can you fall away? Yes. How? You're evil. That's how. Well, how do you be evil? You stop believing the word. That's where it goes. Huh? You, even you, that you may have words of truth to answer. I, I'm again convinced that if people are coming to our churches, if, we, if people are coming and not coming back, I mean, sometimes it's because they hear what we say and they don't like it. That is true. But maybe they never understood what we said. And I, I do find that to be the case a lot. And I'm not going to change closed communion just because I know people don't understand it and don't come back. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying change what we know to be true. However, just being obstinate about the way we talk because we think we're right because 700 years ago it was that way. This is not to take the instruction of today. And you see that translation, translation is the task here. Yeah. Uh, so from there, even you, that whole section is just really worth pondering as being about you. Um, from there, uh, you have your pick. Okay, what I, what I want to pitch to you is this idea. What do I do that makes me preach differently than everybody else? Um, I probably spend more time, <laughs> I'll say it differently. I probably waste more time in my week reading the same passages of the Bible I read yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before and the day before and the day before, an hour or so a day, plus, if I can, than most people. I waste my time repeating the knowledge I already know because I want it to be how I think and I don't want anything else to come in and change it till it's so solidified that I just don't stop. Because I know what it was like to try to keep all the stories together. I did it for a long time. I danced a pretty dance. And you know what? It's a lot easier to just be ignorant of the world and know God. Today is enough. We got plenty today. So, again, where do you go then to decide, Pastor Fist says, I should repeat something from the Bible every day. Start small, work my way to big, but create a mindset that I want to walk in and trust the Bible's there and I'm not really able to get it wrong. If you go and you pick all the verses, I shall destroy my enemies and you know, glorify myself, you're quoting the wrong stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. But go pick your moniker. Confirmation verse is a good place to start. Right? It's like a, that's like a spell out of your slingshot right there. Right? Any moment, any day, you are not your own. You're bought with a price, so honor God. That's mine. Works any time. I can throw it in any conversation. Someone comes in, I hate you. Huh? Yeah, well, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Oh, man, that hurt. <laughs> but like, but like, like you, you have words, right? And then within the Bible, you as a, free, as a Christian are free to choose which words you're going to train yourself to be the spell spitter, the, the wisdom spitter with, right? Um, so what I want to do now is just go through the one that right now is my favorite. And they come and they go, and I have seasons. But right now, I am absolutely addicted to Psalm 118. Please, uh, Psalm 118. If you would find your way there, I'm going to go through uh, almost all of it in order. I'm going to be a little bit rhythmic as I say it, because when I do say uh, scripture to myself in the mornings, I do it almost every morning. Of course, there are days when life changes and you can't do it all. So don't let it be a law to you. But I found music. It's really helpful. If I'm going to read the Bible for an hour out loud, rhythm Rhythm's nice, right? Rhythm's nice. Um, and uh, the, the, you know, who are you and what you would listen to may not be what, what everyone else listens to, but there's something about if it's the same music and the same words every day, now it becomes part of who you really are in a way that is just supernatural, was said again, right? Um, so, so here we go, you know. Let's see. I called on Jesus Christ in my distress. Jesus Christ, he answered me, sent me in a broad place. Jesus Christ is on my side. What can man do to me? Jesus Christ is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on my enemy. 
I'm nervous, so I'm having to come back to it. That is, it's better to trust in Jesus Christ than put confidence in man. It is better to trust in Jesus Christ than put confidence in a prince. When I say it in the morning, I repeat the early part. Because I imagine I'll be somewhere where I've just said, I call on Jesus Christ, and I'm going to say it to you. Call on Jesus Christ in your distress. Jesus Christ will answer you. Set you in a broad place. Jesus Christ is on your side. Do not fear. Do the nations surround you? In Jesus' name. Cut them off. Surround you on every side. In Jesus' name, cut them off. Surround you like bees, like a fire among thorns. In Jesus' name, cut them off. You may be pushed violently so that you fall, but Jesus Christ will help you. Jesus Christ is your strength, and Jesus Christ is your song, and I'll add this in the morning, yesterday, today, forever, Jesus Christ is my salvation. I want to say the stone that the builder was rejected. That's not it. The voice of rejoicing is in the sal- is in the tents of salvation. Uh, the voice of rejoicing is in the... Ah, sorry. I'm all nervous. Performance anxiety. The voice of salvation... Ah, the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of Jesus Christ does valiantly. The right hand of Jesus Christ it is exalted. The right hand of Jesus Christ does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live. And tell us the wrong word. Where is it? Declare. And declare the works of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ may chasten severely, but he does not give over to. It does say death. It's smooth in the Hebrew. But for the Christian, understand this means Sheol, the grave as hell, right? So Jesus Christ may chasten you severely, but he's not going to send you to hell. Open to me the gates of righteousness, then, and I will walk through them, praising the name of Jesus Christ. This is the gate of Jesus Christ through which the righteous shall enter. The song itself. The name itself is the gate. And you're just shouting about it. It's a beautiful, I will praise you. For you have answered me and yesterday, today, forever. Jesus Christ, you have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected is the cornerstone. This is Jesus doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day Jesus Christ has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna. Save us now, I pray. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus Christ, I pray. Send us prosperity or success no uh-huh. i will make sure i get it right blessed is he who comes in the name of jesus christ you know the, the triumphal entry right at that moment when you say this though if, if, the moment you get to say blessed is he who comes in the name of jesus christ you're praying a blessing upon yourself and anyone else who believes it everywhere you go and say it it's just a fact, the, the walls of Zion being built up right around you, right? Mm-hmm. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Jesus Christ. We bless you from the house of Jesus Christ. God is Jesus Christ. And he gives us light, so find the sacrifice of, I tend to say, your heart. And then say it with me now. Lolam kesedol. Say it. Lolam kesedol. Lolam kesedol. Lolam kesedol. Lolam kesedol. So that's two words in Hebrew. We translate it as his mercy endures forever. Lolam kesed. Right. Lolam is whoever, and uh, and kesed, mercy, love, and then uh, kesed do, his. His love forever. His love forever. Lolam kesed It's not only a theme here in Psalm 118, but it shows up uh, again and again in the liturgical texts of later Psalter. So, so that, to me, in the morning, when I, kid you not, rap that to hip-hop karaoke, okay? <laughs> it's how I do it. Um... I don't quite have 18, 118 memorized. I don't quite. Uh-huh. Uh, 55, 56, 57, 54, strong. Jeremiah 30, on the way. Why? Because I want those words to be on my lips all the time. When bad things happen, this is the day Jesus Christ has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Bind the sacrifice of your praise to the highest heavens. It, it, it never goes out of style. It's never irrelevant. You don't have to make it better. You may need to remove all the stuff you put in front of it to try to make it better. Because <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, the, the things that lift up become the things that God tears down. And that's where, as we try to reform our churches liturgically, beware that you don't make new idols because they're just going to get torn down too. Uh, save the word. Let the music rise. Um. So, where are we at here of time? 45. Um, I'm going to just review my notes here for a second. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll shift to this. I didn't go to this at all. So, so what I just gave you there is, is sort of a, a reminiscence of my path as a well-known, 
published Lutheran preacher, author, speaker, post-2020, never saying I wasn't a Christian before, but saying all of us kind of maybe were worshiping the beast more than we should have been. And my path to, to repenting of what I was doing personally in my life came through all those texts I just shared with you. And then there's so much more. I mean, it's just it's endless. Just keep going, right? And as soon as you begin as a people, a congregation, identifying with David or Peter or Paul or Saul, or I mean, not Saul, but um, uh, I want to say Joseph, Noah, when as a group, these are your stories, these are your, these are your heroes. It's not, I like Star Wars and I like Lord of the Rings. Like, it's, it's all one, not just story, but history, identity. I mean, honestly, we're... You look at the, the little Jewish children who look like little Jewish children in New York and you're like, oh, they're weird. Except it's like, they're like, oh, you're weird because we're special. And we have the God. But I'm not sure we believe it as a whole. Again, over time, can I, can I diagnose this in a moment? We didn't realize how powerful entertainment was when it was just a radio so now we just have a different voice running our houses. It's not the voice of the Father, heaven, or home. <laughs> uh, it's the voice of, uh, well, if you watch the commercials, uh, Mother Nature is uh, uh, kind of active these days telling us what to do. And, uh, you can look up that commercial yourself. I want to shift, though, here now to what I do see as a way of talking about the great threat that we have, that we're, we're actually fighting against, and, it, and it's not... I mean, it is, but it's not, you know, the UN or the WEF or, or all these different things. You know, for me in Illinois, Springfield, um, and, and it is local for us. They're putting a new abortion clinic, uh, I don't know, four or five miles from the church. There hasn't been an abortion clinic in Rockford for 20 years. Very strong pro-life community there. Um, and yet very, very Chicago politics. And uh, we're going to make money killing black babies in the poorest part of Illinois. And that's what they're going to do. Um, so so all that matters. Um but what I really think the Christian community needs most is certain types of banners that we can all get behind and not have to argue about whose banner it is and whether we have to listen to them about everything else they say when they say it. Um, and in this then, a large part of it is knowing like who is your enemy. So if I get a Baptist and a Reformed guy and a Lutheran and a Catholic in the room and I say... We should get rid of the Pope. Actually, these days, I bet you all of them tell me, why are you so mean? Right? But now if I just say to them, we should get rid of the Antichrist. They all have to agree, at least for the first 10 sentences, right? Like, they kind of have to be in for a moment. And so what I really am going to suggest here is we, we start understanding how unified our battle is if we pull that biblical language together. So I'm going to talk about what anti-Christianity is like in America today, what this religion looks like. Maybe you could even say what its rules are. And I'm cheating a little bit because I'm, I'm using Gnosticism as my foil for anti-Christianity because, did God really say, is in fact the first sin that we know of, and that we know of, uh, that we see. Uh, so this is about Gnosticism, but it's just easier if we call it lawlessness or anti-Christianity, the actual biblical words. So here's what we're fighting, though. Okay? See if this doesn't just ring very true to you. We are fighting a society, a civilization, a religion in which the belief that you have a personal insight makes you superior to those who don't have that insight. Right? I mean, just look at red, blue. It's that easy, but you can do it with diet and nutrition. We certainly do it with Lutheran dogmatics all the time. Oh, you don't know about the third genesis, my, the third myostatum? You, you don't understand the genesis? Oh, you know, you might, you might not be a Christian. You know, uh, so like the lifting of this personal insight to what it means to be to be good or better, as opposed to seeing personal insight as a means to serving others, right? It's not that insight's bad. Insight's very good, but it doesn't make you better unless it's better at helping others who are not you. Right? So lawlessness versus law. Belief that your insight grants you superiority. Number two, um, therefore and thereby is kind of like number one. Um, it's 
Uh, Anti-Christianity is always an idolatry of a school of thought or an ideology, which is why Lutheranism is an idolatry right now. Uh, the Oxford Confession is true. Lutheranism is an ideology. Uh, and as an ideology, as, as a thing that is not anything but a school of terms, it has not proven itself to be capable of retaining its own spirit. Now, I would suggest that this has very little to do, really, with anything I've said and more to do with the fact that we don't have kids. And the further fact that we don't have kids, which means we don't think it's worth passing anything on, we never kept anything to pass on, and we threw it all out so we could have fun. There's the entertainment side of it. Okay. But school of thought, school of thought, uh, what are you married to that's causing you to fight God? It's almost inevitably a school of thought. Now, I'm trying to do this, and it just won't work. Why? I will guarantee you there's a maxim or a principle or a theory you hold on to that isn't from the Bible, and you just want to believe it's so true. Let's just try Lutheran schools on so you can throw stones at me. <laughs> I've been around. I was raised in one. I'm kind of convinced that if we ever do it again, now you might have one you love, which is great. If we ever do it again after they finish collapsing... We shouldn't do what we did last time. Education's maybe valuable, but uh, we'll come back to that. Idolatry of a school of thought. Uh, Anti-Christianity sees the knowledge of God as a strategy or a principle. The Trinity is a theory. Not someone to like, fall down on the ground before, beg mercy from. Right? Like, it says, like, why doesn't it make sense? Tell me about the Trinity, Pastor. Instead of like, dear God, that can't be real. Ah! Like, but that's sort of like the, the real thing, right? See how, how numbed we are to it. Um, seeing knowledge as a strategy, right? It's just, it's just all ideas. Uh, number four, oh, golly. So the anti-Christianity, the Gnostic, will always worship tomorrow. Progress. Progress. It's always a story about tomorrow. And the story about tomorrow is either, if we don't, bad things. Or, when we do, good things. But suffer today. Follow the beast. Today. So that tomorrow, you can be free. Right. Gnosticism, anti-Christianity, it always promises you a better tomorrow. Christianity, although we are eschatological and believe in the last day, believes that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of the Lord. This is the day that Jesus Christ has made. And you want to go full bore Ecclesiastes chapter 1, all rivers full into the sea, meaningless, meaningless. It's not about how it's meaningless. That's wrong. Vapor, vapor. It's about how there is no past and there is no future for you. There's only now. The past came and went. It's gone. It won't be back. There's now. There's you. And there is no future. When you get to the future, it will be now. Gnostics are always trying to get to the future. Christianity is like, you reign. Like, slow down. Like, even sit down. It's on the wall. Be still. Know that I am God, right? Um, so, the worship of progress. Uh, what? Technology, screens. I guess all this comes into that, right? Uh, Gnostics don't think the body matters. So, I mean, only, only Gnostics could tell a bunch of, I'm going to be very careful I say this, non-athletically active, nutritionally malnourished, posture declined, over-entertained, bored, stupefied people, let's put them in wooden seats that recline at an awkward angle and hurt the tailbone and ask them to sling to slow music that's so loud they can't hear themselves. Because we don't think the body matters. Gnostics. Oh. We, we have to repent of some of this. I'm not saying get rid of the organ. I am saying you can use the organ to kill the church. You can use the pews to kill the church. Uh, how do you make the church live? You don't believe the body doesn't matter. The body matters. How people are breathing in the pew matters. How they sit matters. Did they take notes? It matters. Because when they do, it changes things. Uh, going on, number six. Gnosticism, anti-Christianity is 
This is big fancy talk for a second. Epistemologically reactive to pleasure pain spectrums. And therefore is basically the spirit of debauchery. Uh, that is, uh, when you're worshiping tomorrow, everything is about avoiding pain or gaining pleasure. Everything. And whichever one you pick. So you can be like, well, I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow I die, right? You know, just go off and have a good time, America. Or you can do what's very popular right now. Well, I'm going to be a stoic. Well, I don't believe in pleasure or pain. I just endure. <laughs> you know, and, and if you got nothing else, it's hope. That's the sad thing about that, right? When they don't have Christ, that's hope. Buddhism, same thing. Number seven, uh, because it's about tomorrow, it's also the worship of novelty. So, of course, technology has uh, a strong hand in anti-Christianity because it seems like it's going to change it. So everything's different now. Well, not really. Uh, number eight, a Gnostic is spiritually compelled to tell you what he's doing because you can't see the proof in what he did. <laughs> Follow that? <laughs> They've got to justify themselves out loud to everybody else, not only because we all do this all the time, but also because whatever they're saying, when they turn around, it doesn't look like it's working. So they got to go and try again because they don't care about the body again, right? It's not real. And instead, they'll just boast about how it's all going to work. I'm a cat. I was born a cat. When you let me be a cat, I'll be happy, right? Boasting without knowledge. That was an extreme kind of ludicrous example, but... I, I suggest watch your own tongue. Everything I'm saying, if you're taking notes, go home and before you try to fix others, recognize your tongue is probably more active with Gnostic talk than you realize. And then you listen to it. You don't have to. It's not, you're not, not a Christian. It just means you're walking around and this stuff comes in and you repeat it and you listen to it again. You know, okay. You know, because we're just, we have so much information coming at us. Which we, again is why I'm suggesting get to some scripture, repeat it every day. That never changes. Now you got an anchor. An anchor in the storm. Um, Number nine, Gnosticism, anti-Christianity does not require a belief in God, only a belief in knowledge. Welcome to atheism. It's been around for a while. Hello, Gnostics. Um, and uh, the final result of all of this, the Gnostic then is self-conscientiously obsessed. It's always about finding the self, renewing the self, growing the self. But at the end of the day, they're mostly watching everybody else, and really careful not to step out of line. And that's how everyone walks these days. Now, you know where your lines are, and you walk fast, but you don't step out of line, do you now? Well, that would be against what we're supposed to do. The knowledge would break. Um, I'd love to talk more about how uh, teaching math in Lutheran schools is uh, Pythagoreanism and is a competition with uh, the Spirit of God in Solomon and that education is the idol of Plato. Um, so if I can maybe close with some of that thought, uh, that um, if I'm going to talk about homiletics and preaching, what I hope I did not do today was educate you with principles that you will write down as theories and then tell yourself now you understand. I, I really hope that, that that's not what I ha what happened. Um, uh, but that instead, uh, I just lost my where I was going with it, um, That rather than believe that we're here to have some sort of enlightenment in which we all now think better and go about and act as gods, right? um, that instead of what you've heard is that the spirit of God is alive. The living God is alive. Jesus is the name of the living God. And you don't need me to access him. His salvation his mind. And then, because this is his gift to you, this is the promise of Christianity, receiving, seizing, grabbing that mind and putting it on your path. Like, it's the stones, and you're on the ground because you just got to put some stones down. You're used to Star Wars again. You don't even know where to step. So you start laying the groundwork over time. That becomes a stable foundation in your life. And I really mean that. that whatever the winds are out there, it's kind of amazing how peaceful it is. When in the name of Jesus Christ, you cut them off. And you look up at the sky. Moon's still there. The sun's going to come up tomorrow again. None of that's changed. And why do I believe the rest of it has changed? Um, I want to close with Ecclesiastes chapter 12 again. If you go back there for a sec, it's going to read um, a section to close it. And we're right at an hour. Uh, I just, Ecclesiastes, you can't read it enough in these times. Um, 
and you know, read it from the perspective of Solomon knows you're a Christian already. Okay, so Proverbs, he's going to convince you to trust Jesus. That's his, his point. Ecclesiastes, he's just more explaining what he did and explaining how, like Job will teach you, once you have all the proverbial wisdom, it still doesn't mean like you build every tower you want whenever you feel like it. It doesn't mean that at all. Uh, God will give you work to do. Do it according to his word. It will be blessed. When you seek a lot that is not your lot, that is what a curse is. Not going to be cursed. It's a curse to be discontent with your lot. 11 and 12 um, run all as a, a big poem, I think. I, and you could go a little further, but I'm just... I'm going to read. I might slow down toward the end, but um, it's just so full of good stuff. Starting at chapter 11. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Homiletics. I mean it. Yeah, homiletics. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Truly light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun, but if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. All that is coming is vapor. So rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into mishpat, judgment, measurement. Uh, therefore, remove sorrow from your heart. Lutherans, write that down. <laughs> you know, like it's an active thing. Do it. You can do it. It's okay. Like try to not be sorrowful. Look, I'm a depressed person. I battle depression my whole life. I'm not saying give up your depression. I'm saying believe God actually tells you you can feel better. Like pursue it. Like it's true. It won't be perfect, but it... remove sorrow from your heart. Put away evil from your flesh. Those probably go together. How can you remove sorrow from your heart when you're watching evil actions? over and over again and calling it fun. Huh? Huh. That's kind of a barb, I suppose. Uh, childhood and youth are vanity, vapor. Remember now, verse chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, so good. Remember now the creator in the days of her youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are not darkened and the clouds do not return after the rain and the day when the keepers of the house tremble the strong men bow down when the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows grow dim when the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low when run rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low also they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way when the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden and desire falls. For man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. So remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well and the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it vapor. A vapor, says the preacher, all is vapor. Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he taught the people knowledge. He pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher, which by the way, preacher, it, it doesn't mean proclaim. The word isn't proclaim. It's actually about collecting things. Gathering, the gatherer, or if you like the Marvel timeline, the, the collector. He actually is the collector. <laughs> That's what they called him. Um, and he's collecting truth. Now, here's a fun one too, though. Took this. Gatherer, collector. Well, what's, what's gather? How do you say gatherer or gathering in Greek? Somebody, pastor. Assembly. Ecclesia. Ecclesia. He's the church maker. 
Thus says the church maker, one shepherd. It says too, one shepherd. Who is Solomon? Shlomosh, man of peace. Who is the son of David? Not that one wisest guy who did all the stupid stuff and died, right? But the actual wisdom incarnate from on high, who now is your king, your God, and the sender of the Holy Spirit, who makes you alive to believe these things. Well-driven nails. My son, be acknowledged by these, verse 12. Of the making of many books, there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. So let us hear the conclusion. It basically is saying, it's not that you shouldn't make more books. It's just at the end of the day, more books don't fix it. You can conclude it all simply. You know, I'm, I'm a little over time. Brian Wolfmuller is fond of saying, oh, he's read the first 10 pages of many, many books. You ever heard him say that? He's, he's, I, I took a, when he said that the first time, I was like, it's genius. And I, I began, you know, if I didn't like it after 10, 15 pages, or even if I did, I was like, well, my notes are good enough. I think I know what he's going to say from here on out. Right. So with that being the case, then, the world doesn't need more books. It needs more single statements of the word of God in individual places. So the making of many books, there is no end. But fearing God and keeping his commands, this is man's all. Right? And would you have the religion of the New Testament? Take a lesson from James. It is trust in Jesus that inspires you to care about the fatherless and the widow and the afflicted. And to believe we're sojourning towards something that will well, explode in glory soon enough. But in the meantime, salvation is today. And that means if I call upon the name of Jesus because my enemies are at the gates, I am to believe he will send a solution. And that solution might be my martyrdom. And by the time that happens, I'm going to be kind of like knowing why, I think. Go read the history of Paul's conversation with, uh, um, uh, it's not Caligula, um, Nero, before he dies, right? The, the, it's tradition, but the history of it. Paul knows he's going to die. He knows that this is his chance to testify. That he always wanted to testify in Rome. Here he is. He gets to do it. And he does it. It's clear in the conversation. Nero's getting more insane, more angry. He's going to be killed. Do you think at that point, Paul's like, well, you know, Father, save me, or Father, glorify your name. Because I see Nero losing his mind, but I see his soldier listening. And when I die, Ben Kenobi got nothing on me. Huh? Yeah, yeah, you got it. So, so, fear God, keep his commands. This, this is all. Um, I should have started with this. Why do I preach the way I preach? Biblical illiteracy is the way that Gnosticism is destroying us. So the solution is sola scriptura. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thanks for listening.